Good morning and welcome to First Parish Brewster. We are a Unitarian Universalist welcoming congregation of people of diverse philosophies and beliefs, people of various cultures and races, sexual orientations, gender identities, abilities, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Whoever you are, wherever you are on your path, may this be a place of rest and restoration on your journey. For those of you who may be first time visitors this morning, welcome. Welcome on this morning, which we make, pre which we make oh, sacred just by our that. presence together. If you are visiting, please let us know in the chat box. A big welcome to people calling in. We are so glad that you are here. I am Wilderness Sarechild, happy to be welcoming you to this service, which I am co-leading with Abby Walters and joined by members of the Reparations Task Force. Twinks Hastings, our Director of Lifelong Religious Education, is on tech support. Our chat box will be off during parts of this service. Our service offers closed captioning. To access closed captioning, you need to turn it on in your taskbar. Welcome to worship this morning. It is so good to be together. Sarah, James, Jesse, Hannah, Oliver, Jolly, Jack, Hampshire, Anna, Mary, James, Molly, and Millie. They have all graced this congregation. They have been reaching out to us for almost 300 years, but we have not been listening until now. Now we are called on to speak their names. Sarah, James, Jesse, Hannah, Ol Oliver, Jolly, Jack, Hampshire, Anna, Mary, James, Molly, and Millie. Their spirits live in these walls. Their presence sits in these pews. They were the property of our parishioners. We will now remember their names, honor their names. Though they are slave names, their original names lost in time and captivity. We blame the South, but the North is not innocent. We blame other religions but Unitarians are not exempt. We point a finger out there, but three fingers point back to ourselves. The Reparations Committee has been meeting since the fall of 2020, researching chattel slavery on Cape Cod and at First Parish in particular. We are still researching. The names we bring you today are not the complete list. In addition to the enslavement of people, did some of our sea captains carry captured Africans as cargo? It seems likely. Our research is continuing. Did the Cape economy profit from the industry of slavery in the West Indies? Yes, 
we shipped salt cod to feed the enslaved people in captivity there. We are learning what our first, par what our first parish ancestors did to sustain slavery here and elsewhere. And we are looking at how to make reparations for this past harm that continues today in the many forms of white supremacy. It is shocking and upsetting to hear that our liberal and enlightened religion, committed as we are to social justice, has a history that brings shame on our past. But we should not say that was the past, we're not like that now. Because the past is still alive in the inequities that black, brown, and indigenous people continue to face in housing, education, healthcare, policing, and the criminal justice system. It is time for First Parish to begin the process of reparations. You will learn more in this service about our past and our hopes and recommendations for the present and the future. It will probably feel overwhelming to consider all that needs doing. This is not a one or two year project. It will take many years, a lifetime even, of ongoing commitment. We are asking you, dear congregants, to open your hearts to hearing the difficult, to stay curious and receptive, even if and when you may feel resistance. I believe we are up to the challenge. I believe in you. We light the chalice today in the spirit of our congregational commitment to justice in action. Though you will stay muted for your own pleasure, we invite you to join the choir in singing Spirit of Life. Thank you, choir. Susan Talmadge Smith will now share a prayer written by Christian Schmidt.
Will you join me in the spirit of prayer? Let's all take a breath together. Settle into your chair, relax your body, and open your heart to receive a prayer for hard times by Christian Schmidt. Spirit of life and love, be with us in this time as people suffer, as parents grieve, as violence rages. Be with us who feel the pain of loss, who feel anger at injustice. Be with the oppressed and change the heart of the oppressor, for we know that both are joined in their humanity, no matter how often we forget it. Help us remember the hope we had the hope we have, and the hope we will have. Help us remember joy in the midst of sadness, success in the midst of challenge, and good things in the midst of bad. Help us to be better people, to work for better things, and to create a better world. Blessed be. Let's take a moment of silence together. We will now hear a personal reflection from Chuck Ross. I've known for decades that branches of my family participated in the enslavement of people of color and African chattel slavery. On my father's side, I'm descended from equal parts committed upstate New York abolitionists and enslaving Southerners. They fought against each other in some of the Civil War's most brutal battles. And then, somehow, the next generation saw past the bayonet blades their fathers had borne and married each other. It's always fascinated me that those parents who became each other's in-laws could tolerate being in the same church at which that marriage was sanctified. But my mother's side, a combination of Boston Irish Catholics and Pilgrim and Puritan descended Methodist Episcopalians, always seemed to me to be apart from this particular sin of America's past. My grandmother's family all arrived in Boston in the 1840s and 1850s at the lowest end of the city's social order. My grandfather's family, likely upper middle class, well, they had lived in Massachusetts and Connecticut for centuries. What would these builders of that city on a hill and those signers of a compact that would become a national founding document and a model for the covenants we regularly enter into as you use have had to do with enslavement? It has opened my eyes to learn they were, in fact, early practitioners of the practice. And they did so here in Brewster which was then known as North Harwich, or the North Parish of Harwich, even as they were founding this church in 1700. I came to know this, as one does these days, in part through Ancestry.com. It was two or three years ago, and I was reading about plans being made for the celebration of the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower's arrival. I pulled out some old paperwork and started digging. An aunt had put together a genealogy that showed a line of descent from the elder William Brewster to, well, me. The name of the fellow whose mother was William Brewster's granddaughter caught my attention, 
as it might have caught yours if you spent any time reading the commemorative plaques that line our sanctuary walls. That name was John Freeman, memorialized as one of the church's founding members and whose remains now are at rest in the old burial ground behind the church. Searching Freeman's name in Ancestry.com led me down a path that ended with his will, which was executed upon his death in 1721. This is actually a pretty fascinating document because John Freeman appears to have owned a good part of what is now Brewster. I've puzzled over it several times trying to define trying to identify the various parcels the will bequeaths to various family members. And those family members' names, through the marriages of his multiple daughters, read like a who's who of early Cape Cod history, including Crosby's and Snow's and Nickerson's and Mayo's, along with my absolute favorite, Chillingsworth Foster, who, in my dreamcast for the movie, would be played by Benedict Cumberbatch, just for the room it would all take up in the screen credits and how much fun it would be to say. But one of those bequests took me up short. In between his gift of all the meadows, flats, beaches, and sedge ground between Seatucket Brook and Great Namskakit River, and one bed with bedstead, bed cord, and suitable furniture and covering. In a single throwaway line, the will noted this. Item, I give and bequeath my Negro man called Hampshire to my wife, Mercy, and my son, John Freeman. I've done a little bit of sleuthing, but I haven't been able to find out anything more about Hampshire. Although I have learned that the name Hampshire could have been a variation on Hampshire. I also learned that Freeman's father, Major John Freeman, himself an enslaver, but whose will freed the enslaved Toby and Bess, might have played a role in the enslavement of native Wampanoag men. As assistant to Plymouth Colony's governor, he served on a court that between 1674 and 1677, sentenced at least four native men to be sold into the brutal Barbados plantation, uh, plantations for sugarcane. One for breaking out of prison and stealing a horse, and the other three for suspicions of murder, even though one of those three was actually acquitted of the crime. Oh. And that Major John Freeman, he was also a deacon of the First Church in East Ham. So, it turns out, even here on Cape Cod, our history is built on the enslavement of people of color. How do I think about this family connection for myself? Honestly, I've come to the conclusion that if your family, or bank, or university, or corporate employer, or even church, has had a presence in this country for more than 200 years. Well, we all have a direct connection to this sin, whether or not our ancestors deeded the lives of others in their wills. The economies, North and South, East and West, were based on the ownership of others' lives and labors. And those economies built the economy of which we now are all a part, descendants of those owners, as well as of the enslaved. And that is where the real work lies, I think, in recognizing the debt owed for the blood, sweat, and tears paid into the foundational wealth of this economy today that has never been repaid or even adequately recognized. Thank you, Chuck, for that powerful reflection. We will now hear a personal reflection from Jeff Schwartz.
Good morning. My name is Jeff Schwartz, and I am a member of this church. For many years, I have been considering the importance of reparations, and I'm grateful to see a groundswell of energy springing forth to address this work. Were I to still believe the fairy tale stories on which I was raised, my rightful possession of my home, land, and wealth would not be in question. Awareness of our nation's true history presents a more painful and challenging story. I now know these lands were not acquired in a just and honorable manner, and that the wealth of this nation was not built by just and honorable means. The acknowledgement of these facts holds within it the uncomfortable corollary that I am in possession of stolen land and wealth. Though I did not create that reality, I nonetheless have benefited from it and choose to take responsibility for my part in righting that wrong. Since I believe that the most valuable aspect of life is relational rather than transactional and material, I wish to engage in reciprocity with the earth and all my relations. I understand in my mind and heart that our liberation is bound together. In the words of Lumbee tribal member and author Edgar Villanueva, all of our suffering is mutual. All of our healing is mutual. All of our thriving is mutual. Reparations is not any one act, but an ongoing process of restoring right relationship. One choice I have made in this process involves the ground beneath my feet, the home and land where I reside. I have the great privilege of living on and loving the ancestral land of the Wampanoag people. In my will, I return to my indigenous brothers and sisters, this place I call home. Engaging in this process could look different for everyone based on their particular situation. I envision people with children and grandchildren sitting in circles to discuss our history and what steps could be taken to make reparations. Our relationship to the past and the burdens we bear, physical, emotional, and spiritual, may be different based on our situatedness, but they bind us together on the same wheel of destiny. I pray we may all find the courage and humility to say yes to a new time of mutual healing and liberation. Blessed be. Thank you, Jeff, for that moving reflection. We will now hear from Chris Morin for a stewardship reflection. Good morning. <clears throat> a friend once told me that people join organizations and committees because of the cause, but they stay because of the relationships. I've attended many First Parish Brewster services where I've come to tears. Because of the music played, the song sung, the messages, the people involved, the tears kind of depict for me the way the world I think could be. And so that's why I stay. I pledge to First Parish Brewster because I believe in the same values as this congregation. Values that include equity, compassion, accountability, justice. And we don't only believe in these values, but we act on them. We have building a bigger table, you, you, the vote, welcoming committee, our youth programs, and so many more. I can't participate in everything that I believe in, but by pledging, I can support them. So this is why I stay. I want to live my life through a social justice lens. And First Parish Brewster helps me do that, helps me to stay on path. When I wanted to take action on my belief in racial justice, I attended a general assembly a few years ago whose theme was racial justice. And when I returned with the assistance of Reverend Jessica, I was able to facilitate a process that brought beloved conversations to First Parish Brewster. Over 50 people 
participated in this eight week course. And after that, we did plant more seeds to do deeper racial justice work. So this is why I stay and this is why I pledge. Please take action this year and pledge to First Parish Brewster. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Each week we have the practice of splitting our plate. Half of what is collected goes to the work of First Parish and half goes to a worthy organization. Our community organization this week is LFI POC Cape Cod. POC, <clears throat> excuse me, POC meaning people of color. Amplify POC Cape Cod is a racial justice initiative to help amplify the businesses owned by people of color on Cape Cod. Amplify POC Cape Cod promotes racial equity to people of color owned businesses by providing resources and education that enhance visibility, increase patronage, and highlight their successes and contributions in order to provide sustainability and reduce the wealth gap caused by systemic racism. There are a couple of ways you can give today. You can text to give, the number is in the chat box, or you can mail a check to the church made out to FPBUU with split plate and today's date. You can also donate on our website. However you choose to give, we thank you for your generosity this morning. The offertory will now be gratefully accepted. Thank you everyone for your generosity. I invite you to listen to this poem called Reparations, written and performed by Summer Durant. This poem does contain strong language, 
So if that doesn't suit you this morning, I invite you to turn off the volume for the next few moments. So we so get it. We get it. We did a bad thing. We killed millions of people, permanently altered the trajectory of their lineage, exploited their bodies to the fullest extent of survival, dampened their minds, and stifled their capacities. We stole generations of innovation and joy and creativity. We stole life, literal life. But what can we do about it now? What will fix it now? Why can't you stop talking about it now? It's like over. Like so last season or century or whatever. I mean like you do have a solution to this problem we created, right? So like go ahead. I'm waiting. What exactly do reparations look like? Well, Reparations look like me going on several dates with white men and ordering the most expensive thing on the menu, while simultaneously grilling them on black history facts and maintaining uncomfortably intense eye contact. Reparations look like reading I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings while humming A Change Is Gonna Come and feeding dog food to the Trump supporter chained in my basement. Reparations look like swerving every fiscally conservative Republican who DMs me, even if he says he's the same party as Lincoln especially if he says he's the same party as Lincoln. <laughs> Reparations look like going to happy hour with the white woman who has a PETA sticker slightly overlapping the Confederate flag bumper sticker on her car and leaving her with a $300 bill. Reparations look like never laughing at your jokes, like saying every dish you make is tasteless, even if I saw you put the whole damn spice rack in it. They look like calling you on your bullshit and clapping while I do it. Reparations look like permanently altering the trajectory of the lives of of millions of people, of their lineage. They look like fostering their minds and expanding their capacities. They look like generations of innovation and joy and creativity. Reparations look like you making some type of effort beyond asking me to abracadabra you an easy solution. They look like the answer you have always been afraid of. They look like a cross perpetually burning on your front lawn for every dollar your ancestors made from my ancestors' screams. Reparations look like you holding your breath for the last three minutes, like the uncomfortable silence that will likely follow this poem. They look like all of the words you hoped I would never learn to read. They look like a block party in a gated neighborhood with perpetually burning crosses as far as the eye can see and a deflated moon bounce and tasteless potato salad that I saw you dump the whole damn spice rack into. <laughs> Reparations look like me still standing in the wake of your destruction. Look like not having to answer this question just because it conveniences you. Reparations look like the least you can do. They look like the least you could fucking do. Good morning. I'm Abby Walters, and I serve on the Reparations Task Force here at First Parish. I grew up on Cape Cod, and I currently live in Boston. During this pandemic, I have only visited the Cape a handful of times. I pine for the Cape. I pine for a long walk on the beach, beach with the March wind whipping stinging sand against my skin, skin that is red from the cold, cold lapping waves, waves that thunder and silence my busy mind. My mind at ease from the thick and salty air air that has smoothed the bark of our resilient scrub pine, pining for the wide reach of the horizon, pining for this sanctuary of sand, seagrass, and shells, a sanctuary that marks the rising tide with the seaweed, a sanctuary when March is still winter and I am weary of the cold and gray, when our part of the earth still free feels frozen and is still turning towards the sun. In this sanctuary, I feel connected. Connected to our community, to our earth, to those who came before me and to those who will come after me and also find sanctuary on our sandbar. And the work of the Reparations Task Force has strengthened this connection 
and deepened my understanding for why, as a congregation, we need to make a commitment to the ongoing process of reparations. The history part of the reparations task force has spent hundreds of hours reviewing wills, bills of sale, tax inventories, personal diaries, land records, and many other documents in the archives. These records are but a sliver of the social memory of what our congregation was like in the 18th century. Here is what we have learned so far. Early census records record black and indigenous people on Cape Cod, both enslaved and free. In 1754, a census record recorded eight enslaved black men and six enslaved black women in Harwich, which would later become Brewster. The census did not record the names of the enslaved people, nor did it mention who enslaved them. And we found this time and time again in our work, the silence of the archives. Archives are not neutral places. They are created. And the Western archival tradition has prioritized preserving the white, rich, and powerful's history. This condition is challenging because few documents about the lives of enslaved people on Cape Cod exist beyond brief mentions in people's wills. This means that our archives record a truth about, the, about slavery on Cape Cod, but not necessarily the truth about the lives of enslaved people as told by them. This silence continues in a 1771 tax inventory that records five Harwich residents enslaving six people simply referred to as servants for life between ages 14 and 45. Again, we don't know anything about them beyond their bondage for tax purposes. We do know who enslaved them though. And four of them were members of First Parish Brewster. Their names were Widow Desire Bangs, Elkana Bangs, Kenlam Winslow, and Nathaniel Stone, the son of our first minister. Kenlam Winslow and his will also bequeathed his wife, Abigail, a woman he enslaved named Millie. Widow Desire Bangs was married to Benjamin Bangs, a wealthy business owner and sea captain here on Cape Cod. He kept diaries from 1742 to 1765. And in these diaries, Benjamin, Benjamin mentions five people that he enslaved. Their names were Hannah, James Oliver, Jesse Caesar, Jolly and Oliver. He described these people as both black, indigenous and mixed race. We also have a record for a bill of sale for an enslaved woman named Sarah. Benjamin Banks purchased her from Thomas and Patience Clark for five pounds, 13 shillings and four pence. The Clarks were also members of First Parish Brewster, meaning that our congregants participated in the slave trade amongst each other. The Clarks enslaved other people besides Sarah. Thomas bequeathed patience, and I quote, to have his little slave Molly and to have one horse. Patience enslaved many people throughout her life. Her first husband, Samuel Hall, listed, his will listed a black man and a black girl among his listings of furniture and livestock. We don't know their names. Patience at the end of her life bequeathed three people that she enslaved, Jack, Anna, and Mary, to her nephew. And our congregational records show that Patience had two black women that she most likely enslaved, baptized at our church. And one of the original covenant signers, John Freeman, bequeathed an enslaved man, Hampshire, to his wife and son. Have you lost count? That's 15 names we know and five unnamed people. And that's who we've identified so far. And there are people who may never have appeared in the archives. This is at our church, our church. And these members have had a lasting impact on our congregation. Their names are on our walls. They gave their time, money and effort to build this church, our church so that we can be here and worship together 
321 years later than when that first covenant was signed. This is what we have learned so far, and we have so much more work to do. We have more wills to review, more to learn about what roles our members and sea captains played in the slave trade and the slave economy. To learn how First Parish came to own this land that the Wampanoags once lived on. And this history is tangible to us. It's in the land we worship on, the sanctuary we gather in, the pews we sit in, the endowment that enables the work of this church. All of these were in part built by the time or donations of these members. And as we see in the wills, if not the enslavers themselves, then their children or grandchildren who inherited their land and wealth. This church has a long generational history. During this research, Chuck Ross and I both learned that we have great grandparents who were members of First Parish and likely worshiped together. In a different building than the one we gather in now, but on the same land and in the same congregation. Could these ancestors of ours ever imagine that their eighth and ninth great grandchildren would be together in worship? Let alone the ways that we worship now, a service led by women, a congregation that celebrates its LGBTQ members, let alone that we have honest and accurate conversations about sex and sexuality as part of our, our whole lives curriculum. So much has changed in the 321 years since this church's founding and so much more for the better. I invite you now to listen to six word statements prepared by the members of the reparations task force. Reparations, equality, dignity, denied then, justice now. Acknowledge harm, apologize, grieve, restore, heal. Shattered lives, silent archives, reparations, revolutionize. Inequality, deniability, complicity, responsibility, accountability, equality. Challenge and justice offer hope, opportunity, and equity. Research reveals enslavers here. Reparations owed. Accept responsibility. Repair damage through action. Reparations means humbly restoring right relationship. If not today, when? Reparations now. Our faith is a covenantal faith. It is about the promises we make to each other to build a more just world. We do not have a creed. We make our faith in each other. At this time, our congregation is working to create a new living covenant so that we may affirm trust and side with love. I want to challenge ourselves to think generationally that the covenants we make can be generational. That we will make covenant with the people, Sarah, James, Jesse, Hannah, Oliver, Jolly, Jack, Hampshire, Anna, Mary, James, Molly, Millie, and the people left unnamed by the archives. That we, 321 years later, will make amends for the injustice of their enslavement. That we will make covenant with the people alive today, within and beyond our congregation, whose ancestors were enslaved, 
that we will make amends for how slavery has fundamentally changed the path of their lives. That we will make covenant with a people who are not yet born, that will also worship in this church, that they inherit not only the legacy of slavery, but also the legacy of our commitment to making amends for wrongs and making reparations. While we are doing this important covenantal work, our congregation will also be taking a vote to adopt the eighth principle at our annual meeting. This principle calls us to journey towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism within ourselves and our institutions. Reparations are how, as a congregation, we can live by the covenants that we make and keep with those who are dead, living, and not yet born. Reparations are an ongoing process and a commitment to be part of this justice-making process that involves specific forms of repair for individuals, groups, and nations. To take responsibility for this past and present harm, the Reparations Task Force identified five guiding actions one, acting to stop the systems and practices that cause harm. Two, changing the laws, institutions, and systems to ensure that the harm will not repeat. Three, acknowledging and apologizing for the harm. Four, compensating those who were harmed, including their families, communities, and descendants. And finally, restoring individuals to the position they were in before the harm whenever possible. These actions and goals were developed with lessons from the Reparations Now toolkit created by the Movement for Black Lives, as well as international law. We see reparations as being the sum of many interconnected actions that will help us keep the covenants that we want to make with those who are dead, living, and not yet born. Reparations are how we work to recognize the inherent worth and dignity of every human being as we work to make the world a more just, equitable, and compassionate place. And as we work to dismantle racism within ourselves and our institution. So what could reparations look like at First Parish? Reparations can look like advocating for black and indigenous people of color to be in positions of power at our congregation the UUA, and our community. Reparations can look like recognizing our ties to slavery on our website and creating a learning trail about slavery on Cape Cod. Reparations can look like committing a portion of our endowment, operating budget, and split plates to make payments to individuals and organizations. Reparations can look like returning land back to the Wampanoag. The Reparations Task Force is learning what other congregations are doing too. For instance, an Episcopal church in Barnstable has decided to commit $500,000 in reparations over the next five years. They are doing this in part because they learned that their congregation was founded by people, by enslavers, but also because they learned that their congregants work to maintain and perpetuate segregation through redlining and voting suppression in Baltimore. Knowing our ties to slavery hasn't diminished my love for First Parish. And frankly, even if we found no evidence of slavery in the archives, I would still be here today for why we need to make a commitment to reparations. Reparations are not about focusing on the individual group of people or institutions. Reparations are about repaying the debt of stolen lives, labor, and land. Reparations are a reckoning of our history. It's about a collective action to dismantle the power structures that were created to benefit white people. And to dismantle these power structures that continues to benefit white people today, even if their ancestors never enslaved someone or their families immigrated to this country after the 13th Amendment was passed. 
This system continues to perpetuate the oppression of Black and Indigenous people, and it includes every institution in our democratic republic. It includes our schools, our churches, our economy, truly our entire economy. In New England, the mill towns created enormous wealth processing cotton picked by the hands of enslaved people. New England fishermen made a profit selling salted cod to the West Indies to cheaply feed the enslaved people on plantations. And Northern financial institutions accepted enslaved people as collateral to secure mortgages. And white supremacy has evolved since the 13th Amendment was passed. It evolved to sharecropping, evolved to Jim Crow, evolved to voting suppression, evolved to mass incarceration, evolved to the war on drugs. And we will need to worship how our congregation benefited and perpetuated from these evolutions and make reparations for that too. The vision of the reparations task force is that this congregation will make a commitment to the ongoing process of reparations. We welcome input from the congregation and can look um, what reparations can look like and you're welcome to join the task force. The task force is working to develop recommendations to, develop, to deliver to the congregation at our annual meeting in June. We will not accomplish everything this year. We have so much more to learn and we have so much more work to do. And I know that we will have strength and guidance from the covenants we make with ourselves, with each other, with those who came before us and with those who are not yet born. The covenants and we make and keep with that which is holy and infinite, with the spirit of life and love. These covenants, will guide our way of being as we work to make the world a more just, equitable, and compassionate place and journey to our spiritual wholeness by dismantling racism within ourselves and our congregation. And our commitment to reparations will be part of a rising tide to give life the shape of justice. And justice for those alive today, for those who came before us, and for those who will come after us we can give from deep within ourselves. We can change ourselves, our congregation, our community, our country with our love and action. We can give from deep within ourselves. We can change the world with our love. I invite you now to sing and hum along with the First Parish Choir to Love Will Guide Us. Karen Watson Etzel will now deliver our closing words written by Rosemary Bray McNatt.
This is a reading by Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt, entitled Essential Work of Justice and Liberation for All. By no means are we Unitarian Universalists perfect. We often fail as much as we succeed. Yet even when we have broken our vows a thousand times, we return to this essential work of justice and liberation for all. We do the work best when we remember what church is and what it is not. Church is not a place to hide. It is not the place to get away from the world. It is not a place where we get to pretend that the lives we live and our particular situations are not terribly complex, often confusing, and sometimes depressing. Church is the place where we stand with one another, look the world in the eye, attempt to see clearly, and gather strength to face what we see with courage, and yes, with joy. Thank you, everyone.